Australia's cost of living crisis, government versus the RBA. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another week of insights brought to you by Ainsley Bullion and the Gold and Silver Standard. Today is Monday, so Alex is back joining me to continue our discussion on the cost of living crisis that continues to unfold in Australia and how the focus really does continue to be in the wrong direction from the government and the authorities around the best way to address it. How are you going today, Alex? I'm very good. How are you, Chris? Very good. Um, so reading that piece this morning, I thought, well, there's a little bit of the stuff we've been talking about, like uh, still um, coming up, but it was coming from a slightly different angle. And you identified sort of the theme consistent with what we've been saying, but really looking a little bit in a little bit more depth at some of the drivers of what's actually causing it. So the focus on monetary policy or interest rates um, really is where everyone's looking, but you've been making the point that fiscal policy or government spending is where we need to be looking um, to actually save us from a situation. So that's what we'd like to sort of dig into today. Um, I, the article really focused on real wage growth and that caught my attention as something to, to highlight, wow, we're actually going backwards at quite, quite a rapid rate. So can you sort of start off by giving us a little bit of an overview of why we're experiencing that in Australia? Um, in the past, you've spoken about the wage price spiral and you said that's something that might happen overseas, but not necessarily happening here. So you've been proven very correct on that. So can you give us a bit of background on this situation? So we have been talking about this cost of living crisis and what's going to happen with the real wages. And I think what we were trying to show in the article today is what is actually going on in the world, which is it's not going on overseas. It's happening in Australia. Mm. Now, uh, the RBA has been very focused on the wage spiral. Spoke about the fact that net immigration was huge uh, in Australia compared to, say, New Zealand and US when we did that um, article a few months ago, and that it wasn't going to happen here and it was likely to happen overseas. Now, in some ways, that's benefited businesses beautifully. Our unemployment rates risen to 3.7%. Employers aren't paying as much money out. But unfortunately, our inflation... Um, because the monetary policy that we've got right now is so far behind the rest of the world, uh, so we're at 3.35% interest rates, whereas compared to the US, New Zealand, UK, they're well over four, all of them. Um, so their inflation is moderating on the monetary policy, but their real wages because of their immigration policies are actually climbing higher than ours. And what that means is that if their wages are climbing at 4 or 5% and their inflation's at 7%, they've got a negative real wage of 2%. Yep. Um, and in fact, Canada was the second highest. Australia's negative 4.5%. Mm. Canada was negative 25 UK negative 2.4%. And then you've got US and New Zealand, who were the two that we compared the immigration policies on previously, are 02 and 0.3%. So they're not going backwards, whereas Australians are going backwards at the fastest rate of all the developed countries that I've been looking at. Um, and the immigration policy where it helped with the spiral has now put pressure on monetary policy that they can't lift it any further. Rents aren't falling because we've got so many more people coming in yep. um, and wages aren't going up because we've got we've actually got a higher unemployment rate than all those other countries. So we're now really pushing into what we've been talking about, that this monetary policy is going to have to follow the world. But if the government doesn't look after this fiscal side, we're in real trouble. And, you know, I was looking at figures for um, what immigration happened last year and what immigration is happening this year. Well, last year was 190,000 people, which was the biggest intake since the Rudd government uh during the GFC, which actually worked really well in a uh, deflation, sorry, yeah, in a deflationary environment, we've got this inflationary environment now, where we are forcing more people into Australia on a supply side constraint. And now Jim Chalmers is talking about in 2023, 235,000 to 300,000 um, immigrants, not including students. And if anyone doesn't understand what that's not going to do, what that is going to do to supply side and fiscal um, fiscal shocks that are going to happen in Australia, you know, they really need to look at this. 
It's interesting there you said about not not including students because just anecdotally in conversations that I've had with a few people, um, when the Chinese government changed that policy around needing to, I, I think they're back and forward on what they're actually doing, but there was a big push that you needed to be in the country where you're actually studying and all of a sudden um, people found that if they were looking for cheaper rental accommodation in Brisbane, for example, where I'm situated, um, it was a struggle because you had a, a massive influx of students. So they won't even be included in those numbers, will they? I don't think so, no. And I, I have anecdotally heard that 2022 is more around 300,000 people. So maybe yeah. that's the student number. I'm, I'm don't have that data, but I, I know that our immigrants were 190,000, permanent in, immigrants, 190,000 people. It's moderated wages. I mean, our wages climbed 3.3%, um, whereas New Zealand, who's particularly tight, they're at 7.4%. So we're and, miles behind. And, and that's like, those numbers are crazy when you actually, like, I just want to pause on that for a moment because four and a half percent negative, like that's huge. Cause that's a, like in real terms, that means the average Australian is getting a four and a half percent pay cut, even though they'll think they've just experienced a potential pay um, raise because what did you say? It was, there was still a couple of percent there that they are up, but net negative. Oh yeah. So 3.3%, which I mean, you know, I know that wages is usually CPI or three percent. So yeah. we're we're keeping up with the CPI from two thousand and eight that never <laughs> even made. You know, that was the three percent, and now we're hitting inflation of seven point eight percent. And you know, the December figure was eight point four percent. Like it's just insane the difference that it means Australians this year or twenty twenty two went backwards nearly five percent. And, and people probably can't express that as a number. So it's really interesting and, and valuable to hear it expressed as numbers because they're certainly feeling it, but they won't necessarily be able to put their, their finger on exactly why they're feeling it. But that's right there, plain as day, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I saw just in the newspaper today that Kogan released um, some figures saying that they've had to write off $40 million worth of um, stock because they've mm. over they've bought too much. And they're saying that online sales are down 30%. Like, you know, I know people are going to the shops. I know people are spending money elsewhere. Yep. But that's a huge hit to any business, losing 30% of their um, sales. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I just want to pivot slightly to look at some of the other drivers because there was that was one, one factor that was discussed in the news, but there are several other things as well. So can we maybe start looking at... Um, government spending across the states. I found that table really interesting. Um, there seems to be some sort of divergence there between, <laughs> um, and, and maybe not everyone experiencing the crisis to the same degree that was really yeah. highlighted. But you also highlighted things like corporate profits and energy policy. So could you maybe just um, give us a bit of an overview of some of these other drivers that are really impacting the situation? So I'll start with government spending because it was actually something that I wasn't even going to talk about because it wasn't on my radar until someone was uh, chatting to me about it yesterday. She's a consultant. She was telling me that all of these seminars she's going to are just government people talking mm. about how much money they've got to spend, how big their groups are. And, you know, so I was like, oh, she said I, she, her opinion was that that was one of the bigger drivers of inflation. So I did look it up. And um, I would say that it is, um, mm. but based on what I saw, I mean, so the July, September quarter, uh, government expenditure, according to the ABS, increased 6.2%. So, you know, this is money uh, on wages, on materials. So we've got a supply shock and the government's taking 6% more of it than they may have needed previously. So yeah. that's crazy. And then what I thought would be interesting is actually look at where the wages are being paid, because if you're looking at wages uh, being paid in uh, uh, in Canberra, what are they compared to other states? Well, I mean, amazingly, New South Wales is known as a very expensive state, probably the most in Australia, probably more than Canberra. Mm. The average wage here is $53,000, whereas in the ACT, it is $68,000. And who so, makes up the population of the ACT? <laughs> yeah, so you, you look at it and you think, actually, there's a real problem here with government spending as well. Um, corporate profits made the news, I think, which is interesting that they made the news because maybe... Uh, everyone's saying look over there rather than look in your own backyard again yep. um, and 
there was a uh, there was a report that we've written about again where they're saying that um, corporate po profits right now are actually um, driving a huge proportion of the inflation. So they're saying seventy percent of the inflation right now is actually just companies gouging. So you've yeah. got Coles and Woolworths saying, "Oh, prices are going up," and they're preempting prices that aren't going up. Uh, I certainly know Qantas and Virgin about three months ago, the ACCC had a real go at them for Melbourne flights, which, which miraculously I was paying about $500 for a flight to uh, to Melbourne about three months ago, and now I'm paying $200. So there's been a miraculous turnaround. Yeah, and that's so, over half, that's less than half price, isn't it? So less than half price, yeah. and Qantas just recorded a $1 billion profit. But uh, interestingly about the monopolies and duopolies that we've got going on in Australia, the big four banks and their gouging, they know they're gouging. They've actually started talking about, I mean, Qantas said, you know, we've made a billion dollars, but we don't think this is going to continue. They they know that this is limited. So I actually think that that will start to moderate on its own. Um, and then my favourite topic, which is energy costs, um, Looking overseas, gas is now cheaper than it was during the Ukraine war in the US. Now, if anyone doesn't understand this just poor own goal in Australia, we are still paying $25 a gigajoule and pre-Ukraine it was around 6 to $8 a gigajoule. So now we're paying $20 a gigajoule, not the 12 the government said we are, and that's if you can get the gas. Because I have explained and I have seen articles that companies are going to tender and they will not even be given a price for gas. Which is so, just absurd, particularly when you think about how much we produce, like the crazy. But not even that, like the, the talk from the energy companies and these gas companies and the government has been, you know, let let the market moderate, let it come mm. back to, you know, we're a global economy, global prices. Well, why are we now paying? four times what we were paying previously and the rest of the world is paying 30% less. So I, I, this is not a global economy. This is the gas companies, I think, trying to teach the government a lesson to not be involved and punishing business right now and the government doesn't know what to do to deal with it. Yeah, okay. That's um, <laughs> I know that's a, an, an issue that you experience and, and um, personally and it, it, it just makes no sense to anyone outside of that who's not paying attention, you know, because you don't see it. Um, but it's it's so obviously um, manipulation and, and just a massive issue that needs to be addressed there. Yeah, and in some ways, you know, gas, gas companies, are, they're not tendering and they're not giving prices because they don't actually know what they're doing because the government hasn't given them a clear framework. So they are sitting on their hands waiting for a framework because they're terrified about being punished yeah. or, you know, I understand to some extent why they're doing it, but, you know, it's just uh, not working. Yeah, no, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so can just to wrap this up, can you summarise for us and give us a bit of a, a bit of a bigger picture overview of what the government actually needs to do? I mean, the obvious, you, you've made it very clear that reigning in government spending is obviously mm. the thing that, the government needs to do, but what else can they do um, to really make this uh, a situation that we can actually properly live through? All right. So again, we'll talk about monetary policy and this parading of low in front of everyone. Monetary policy, unfortunately, has to continue. If it does yeah. not continue, uh, we are going to have our exchange rate collapse. Um, it will be moderated a bit definitely by commodities. We've got that in our corner. Mm -hmm. But we cannot be at a, a different, an interest rate differential of 2 and 3%, and we are dangerously close to 2%. Yes. So we have to keep going. So, you know, no one wants a, a wage spiral, but if you, can't, um, if you can't play with monetary, you have to let wages climb at a, a relatively fast rate. So the, the first thing is how good was um, immigration for business? three months ago, we've let a lot of people in, stop. That's it. Our unemployment rate is climbing rapidly. Our real wages are declining by 4.5%. 
we have to now let this equilibrate before we let another 300,000 people in this year. Yep. Um, I, like immigration is great for business. It's good, good for me and what I do, but I don't, like I, my husband and I, he has a business and he's a little bit more capitalist than I am. I, I think the wrong people are being punished right now and I think it's a terrible situation. And I think if people, the average, low to middle income earners are going backwards at 4.5%, something, you know, more power needs to be given to workers right now. Um, I think uh, the government's tried to do it with the union stuff that they've tried to push through, but I don't think that's worked and immigration is therefore the only thing that can moderate this. Yep. Um, the second thing is energy, just put a framework in, make it work. This isn't that hard. Uh, that has to that has to be done. And then, you know, monopolies and duopolies, like I said, I actually think that's going to moderate itself. You can see it in the rhetoric from um, all these AGMs at the moment where they're acknowledging yeah. how much money they're made but saying that this isn't going to last. So I think they know. So, you know, the three things are that the government can do right now is rein in this government spending tighten the immigration policy again and um, fix the energy crisis. That that makes it pretty clear. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much <laughs> for your continuing work on this and the deeper dive into some of these issues today. I, I know it's becoming clearer to me every time we talk about it, um, where the problems lie and what the ideal path forward actually is. So I'm sure our audience appreciates that, that as well. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me again. Sorry, I like I like my soapbox to talk about it. <laughs> no, and, and I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm sure everyone else does as well. So thanks everyone for watching. Remember, reach out if you have any questions or comments on the social platforms and we'll try and get to those. Um, I'll be back with our next episode of Insights later in the week. So until then, good luck out there in the markets and we'll talk again soon.